so we've kind of made sense of it all with this pyramid here uh, where we've broken it down into designers, engineers, and analysts. Obviously the lines are kind of fuzzy between all these, but this is kind of how we, we, we see them fitting into our, um, our customer base here. So at the designer level, we have SOLIDWORKS Premium and SOLIDWORKS Simulation Standard. These are amazing tools for just quick kind of go, no go, is this gonna be strong enough checks so that you can move on with the important work of designing your products. Uh, simulation Standard takes the linear statics and the motion solve, and it also includes a kind of uh, an upgrade to that where we can do fatigue analysis. So maybe it survives one load, but can it survive 100,000 loads kind of thing. Moving up the pyramid, we move into our kind of engineers section, and this is where SOLIDWORKS Simulation Professional and SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium fit. We can do uh, wonderful things with our nonlinear solver as well as our linear dynamic solvers, and then you get the ability to do thermal heat transfer and frequency and buckling and that type of stuff in, as well. But SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium falls short of what we would call kind of analyst level simulation, um, like really, really high end stuff. So this is where our Dassault um, products seem to fit in. So uh, Dassault Systems owns a brand called Simulia that has Abacus, the famous Abacus solver, um, as well as Tosca and iSight and a few other programs. Um, but specifically the Abacus solver has been implemented into our structural professional engineer role on the 3D experience platform. So let's talk about the platform a little bit because I'm sure you guys have heard a ton about it over the past couple of years. What is it, why does it exist, and why should you care, right? So the platform itself, well, let's start here. So Dassault Systems is the company that owns SOLIDWORKS, and they also own a number of other brands, um, famously Katia and Simulia and Delmia and Anovia, and all of these other kind of high-level simulation brands. So the, the vision for the platform is to take all of these kind of disjointed um, engineering softwares and kind of put them all in one place where a SOLIDWORKS designer can work alongside a Simulia analyst can work alongside of a Delmia, you know, manufacturing specialist, all in the same environment um, without having the, the issues of different data management softwares and different uh, importing and exporting and all of that. So that's kind of the general idea. Now, I wanted to kind of start off a little bit with uh, talking about the SOLIDWORKS simulation portfolio. So this is the kind of tried and true, what we've been representing for years and years since it came out as SOLIDWORKS simulation in I think uh, mid 2000s. So it comes in three flavors for structural simulation, you know, the standard professional premium, very similar to how SOLIDWORKS is packaged, um, but it ultimately falls short. So we can use our linear, our nonlinear solver and our linear dynamic solver and solve an incredible amount of problems. But it starts to fall short when you get to high strains and a lot of contacts and sliding contacts and things like that. So that's why they've kind of developed this, this platform to where we can um, essentially um, move up, right? Level up, so to speak. So on a, on a similar note to what SOLIDWORKS has packaged, we have our SimuliaWorks suite here. And there's four kind of flavors of this, but most of our customers um, who we see adopting this would probably fall into this right here, the structural performance engineer, also called structural professional engineer. And, um, the name's changed a couple times, but the functionality has stayed the same, where we can take our SOLIDWORKS simulation studies and kind of take them to the next level. It includes the advanced general contact algorithm that uh, Abacus is famous for, as well as more material models than we can use in SOLIDWORKS simulation. Um, also famously, it includes the, the well-known Abacus Implicit Solver. Um, if you need more of a kind of fast, uh, if you need to simulate more kind of fast interactions, um, very short duration events, we can also move up to the structural mechanics engineer role and get the explicit solver as well. But everything we're gonna be doing today is gonna be more or less in the structural performance engineer here. And you'll see how it truly levels up SOLIDWORKS. So here's our roadmap. It's pretty basic, probably take the next uh, 25, 30 minutes or so. We're gonna start off in SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium, our kind of tried and true, and we're gonna analyze this part that you see here. 
Uh, we're we're going to talk about some of the limitations that we see with SOLIDWORKS Premium, and then we're going to use the 3D Experience Connector to essentially load this up to the cloud and then use our structural performance engineer role. So here's our part. Uh, it's just a simple cylindrical part with a bunch of holes through it. The goal for this is to we either have a shaft or some other kind of device in the middle of this that's going to twist the middle of this part around its central axis. And that's going to cause the um, essentially going to cause these holes to collapse and it's going to cause a lot of strain in kind of the thin areas between the holes. So let's look at our material first. Um, we're going to use a Mooney Rivlin material, at least in SOLIDWORKS here. You can see the material constants there. Um, this is only available in Simulation Premium alongside the Ogden material model as well. Uh, the setup's pretty simple. We have a fixed geometry around the outside. Um, actually, it would help if I showed the arrows. Let's go ahead and do that really quick. So you can see the fixed geometry around the outside. And then uh, on the inside, essentially, we just have a, um, a defined translation, right? a prescribed displacement. Where we're just going to rotate this around the central axis to the tune of one radian. One of the big limitations of SOLIDWORKS is its mesh. So we can only use tetrahedral elements in SOLIDWORKS simulation. Um, they're not bad by any means. Tetrahedral elements are great. Um, but a geometry like this is more suited for other types of elements, as we'll see later. But here's what our TET mesh looks like. Um, it's, it could definitely be more dense. Um, wait for that to load here. There we go. Um, but for the purpose of demonstration, it should do just fine. You can see that every face of those elements is just a, a, a triangle, right? So let's look at our results here, uh, specifically our displacement results. So we can see that this did indeed begin to twist a little bit, but even this plot is exaggerated. It's not at true scale. Um, so in reality, as far as the simulation goes, it didn't even get this far. So the, the nonlinear solver kind of uh, errored out and it saved results up until this point. Um, but we're starting to get some really high strains in areas of this model that the nonlinear solver in SOLIDWORKS simulation isn't really built to handle. Um, but if we went into the study properties, we could change some of these time stepping options. We could go into the advanced options, maybe change some of these. We could add extra mesh in. We could definitely get this farther in SOLIDWORKS. Um, there's no question about that. It's just going to take a little bit of uh, kind of trial and error and changing a few things here and there to get it to um, solve further. Uh, can't guarantee it'll solve all the way, but it's going to take some um, take some effort. So what we're going to do instead then is we're actually going to upload this to the cloud so that we can use our structural performance engineer role. So we talked about SOLIDWORKS Simulation Premium. The setup's pretty simple. I think you guys understand the problem. So next we're going to talk about the 3D Experience Connector. So this isn't just a way to export your part to the cloud and then do whatever. It's a collaboration tool. So you can actually use the cloud to store your SOLIDWORKS parts. So we'll see how that works here. So you access it just like the, the PDM Blueberry. You know, we can just save our part from here and then it'll do, um, it'll come up with a login. Again, just like our PDM system would, you log in with your credentials all right, just tell it where it's going to store your parts. Looks great. And then it's going to come up with kind of a, a save options dialog box here. Um, there's nothing too crazy about this dialog box. The only thing we have to make sure that we do is we check that convert button. So that actually launches a separate kind of background process that converts our SOLIDWORKS geometry into something that's usable by the kernel that's on the platform, essentially the software kernel, right? So Clicking save, um, this is still a SOLIDWORKS file. You can still check it out just like you would PDM, open it in SOLIDWORKS, do everything you need to do. Uh, it's just now stored on the 3D Experience platform. But I wanna upload my simulation as well. So we can click the simulation tab here and click create structural simulation. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna convert our nonlinear solve or, or at least the simulation that we've set up here to essentially use Abacus inputs. So it's going to convert our SOLIDWORKS simulation study into a simulation study that we can use with Structural Performance Engineer, All right? So the, the 3D Experience Connector is really simple. It works almost identically to like how the, how the PDM would um, that you guys might be familiar with, All right? So finally, we're going to 
hop onto the 3D Experience platform, check out how data is managed, and play around a little bit with the, the structural performance engineer role. So the platform, since it's cloud-based, you can log in with a browser. So I'm just going to log in just like you would any other website, right? Um, and I like to show this part because it's not shown in a lot of other webinars that I've seen, but I struggled at first with the platform and how I manage data and how I find data because it's not a traditional kind of data management. So what I like to do to stay organized is uh, create a dashboard for all my separate projects. So what I've done for this webinar is I've just created a blank webinar dashboard here, um, totally empty, and we're gonna build it up from scratch so you guys can see how it works. So I'm gonna search for the part that I just uploaded uh, a few moments ago, and that should return a, a number of different files in our search query here. I wanna make sure that I'm getting the correct part before I start anything, so I can select it out of the window and uh, click preview. So this preview functionality will let us view all the metadata and everything that's associated with this part, while also allowing us to use the 3D play widget to view what this part looks like. I'm a very visual person, so I like to be able to see things. And this 3D play is awesome because not only can I see the part's name and everything else, but I can actually move this around, turn it, do whatever I need to. There's, there's functions in there to like do section views and things like that, just so you can make sure you're working with the right file. So that looks like the part we need. I'm gonna go ahead and pin this search that we've just done to my dashboard. So it's gonna be like a widget on this big blank canvas here. So every time I visit this dashboard, that search, those files will be right there. I'm just gonna rename the dashboard um, just to kind of stay a little bit more organized here. Um, again, I'm a visual person, so I like to see things more than read walls of text. So I'm gonna drag another instance of the 3D Play widget onto the dashboard, and then I'll drag the part into that widget. So that way, every time I visit this dashboard, I'm gonna be able to see what part this is representing and um, you know, be able to communicate effectively. You can do markups and stuff in the 3D Play. So it's really neat, um, kind of a very unique way to manage and, and view files. We'll do a little bit more with the dashboard later, um, but the benefit of it is I can do anything I need to with these files from here. So I'm gonna use this to launch our structural scenario creation app. So everyone talks about the 3D Experience platform as being on the cloud, browser-based, um, that type of stuff, but there are a few roles that require local installations. Um, simulation is one of them. To set up simulations and run them, you need there's a small local install that you need to have on your Windows machine um, in order to be able to do that. Looks like mine launched on my other screen. So let me just drag that over here. All right. So it's asking me what I want to do with the simulation studies. So you can see the nonlinear study that we created on this part already in SolidWorks. If we had multiple studies, there'd be multiple ones in there. I want to transfer this one to our existing simulation setup. So we just click OK. It's going to do kind of some background uh, conversions of the boundary conditions and stuff and give us kind of a readout of what was successful. We can see in here that our rubber material model, the Mooney Rivlin, didn't quite carry over. That's fine. I have another material we're going to use on the platform anyway. And then our kind of twisting load didn't carry over either. Well, that's fine. We'll get some practice at setting it up. Everything else carried over. Um, so we should be good to go to begin um, our setup. So here's our part. Here's our tree. My tree's kind of small. Let me kind of expand that out so it's easier to read for you guys. There you go. Um, yeah, so we can go ahead and, and get ready to um, continue our setup on this model. So what I like to do um, is I like to launch the assistant. Those of you who might have used the SOLIDWORKS simulation assistant might know that it's not the greatest thing ever, um, but I find the assistant in Structural Performance Engineer to be really great. You can see um, Xs when things aren't available. You can see errors on, on specific parts of your analysis. I also launched the feature manager here. This is how we can suppress and unsuppress aspects of our analysis. Um, we'll do a little bit of that later, but you can see in the window that we have here that we have some various kind of output requests that are defaults. We have our fixed geometry um, and some other sort of boundary conditions, if you will. And then we also have our tetrahedral mesh and our material definition on the model side of this. We're gonna delete that mesh because we're gonna create a better one. So um, Vitet Mesh, and we'll delete the material definition for our part out of this as well. 
uh, we're gonna use a different type of material model for this analysis. So um, the best way to uh, do an analysis on structural performance engineer is actually to mesh first, which is a little bit different than SOLIDWORKS where you mesh last. So we're just gonna switch to the mesh creation app here and you'll see all of the options that we have for creating our mesh. So we have our, our beam elements and our shell elements in here. Notice that the shell elements now have a quad definition as well. We have our traditional tetrahedrons, um, but we're gonna use a swept 3D hexahedral mesh, also called a brick element from time to time. So we just select the part that we're looking to mesh, pretty easy. And then um, I always check both sides to make sure that it's sweeping the correct direction. And then I click initialize from geometry. It takes kind of a guess at a good element size. We're gonna mesh this with five layers of bricks. Uh, everything else in here looks pretty good. Go ahead and click mesh. Should take just a second here. There we go. So that's a little coarse. I'm gonna dumb that down a little bit, make it a little bit more of a fine mesh. Let's take a little bit longer. Um, but most of the meshing in structural performance engineer is done on a part level um, as opposed to meshing entire assemblies. That looks much better. We have multiple elements through the thickness of a lot of these thin areas. So I'm happy with that. Go ahead and accept that mesh. Next thing we're gonna do is apply, a, uh, apply our material. So we'll switch to the model app here for that. Um, go into their section properties here. Again, we just select the, the part out of the, the graphics window and we can use a, a, a search function for our materials, very similar to the material definition in SOLIDWORKS. I like to anchor this over here just to keep things neat and tidy. So I have another hyperelastic material here on the platform that I want to apply. Um, so we're just gonna kind of navigate through my list of materials here until we find it. Um, yep, there it is, rubber hyperelastic. So this will bring up kind of the data card associated with it, when it was made, who owns it, that kind of stuff. But I'm concerned about the simulation properties. And the suit among you might notice that those are very different from the Mooney Rivlin um, material properties. So we'll talk about that here in a second. But I'm happy with that material. It's now in our materials box in the solid section. Click OK. So now we've basically replaced everything that we got rid of from our um, initial study. So I wanna show you guys the, the advanced material capabilities of structural performance engineers. So let me just go into the definition of our material here. Uh, so I can kind of show, oh, looks like I clicked on the part instead of the material definition. Let me go in and just open that one more time here. Sorry about that. Um, again, just in the materials list and then there's a simulation definition there. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so here you can see our, our vast list of different types of materials that we can add. Um, this is a hyperelastic material um, that's using a Yao material property. We can add different behaviors to our materials. So under different loading conditions, some materials might act differently. Um, so we can add like a, in this case, a hyperelastic material and an elastic behavior and combinations of behaviors, which is neat. Um, also in structural mechanics engineer, we can actually upload material test data um, to the platform and it will actually do a, uh, a material calibration where it kind of walks through different material models and finds out which one fits your test data, uh, test data best. So that's a really neat functionality. But we have hyperfoam material models, uh, viscoelasticity, uh, there's special gasket type materials we can add. Um, just way above and beyond anything that SOLIDWORKS can do as far as materials go. So let me jump back into our simulation here. Um, we can see from the assistant that our parts is checked off, indicating that we're good to go for our material definition. Uh, we need to do some stuff with interactions, which is contact, and our loads still haven't been defined. So we're gonna deal with that stuff next. So before we apply our, our rotation here, I want to switch to our model app and um, go to the connections. So we're gonna create what's called a coupling. And this is just a way to 
define a set of nodes on a face um, as rigid um, or kinematic or something like that. So let me hide this so I can select that face easier. But this is going to help us with post-processing and it's going to help us apply the load as well. So I'm just going to select that inside face just like we did in SOLIDWORKS. It's going to be a kinematic coupling. This allows us to control all the degrees of freedom of the nodes on that face explicitly, um, which is pretty neat. So we'll go ahead and accept that. And now that that's in there, it'll be stored as essentially what's a simulation feature. So I can go in and grab this feature from our simulation properties later. And we'll see why that is a good time saver here in a few. So now that we have that, we can go ahead and apply the loads. Um, I like to just double click loads from the assistant here, which will switch us to the structural scenario creation app, which is where you apply loads and fixtures and things like that. You build the scenario. We're gonna apply a rotation to the coupling we just created. So instead of selecting the face, we'll just go to the connections out of the dropdown and then select uh, our coupling. Click okay. Um, in this case, I'm gonna try to turn it 180 degrees. I don't think it's gonna get there, um, but we'll see how far it gets um, for that rotation. All right, we'll click okay. All right, so now we can see that loads is checked off in our list. So now we have to apply our contact. So contact is one of the most powerful things about this Abacus solver. Before we define it, let's uh, enter our contact properties, AKA essentially just friction. So I wanna make sure that we define our friction coefficients ahead of time. There's a number of different friction models we can use. Um, usually I stick with this kind of default where you just enter a simple friction coefficient and go from there. All right, so we'll go ahead and accept that. And now we can apply our general contact. So this will apply to all surfaces on the entire model. So I won't have to select any faces and it'll apply that friction coefficient to any surfaces that come into contact throughout our entire simulation. And as you can see from this model, there's a ton of surfaces. Um, so once the contact is applied, we have all the, the, the green checks in our tree. So we're just about ready to um, run this model. Before we run it, um, I want to kind of prepare our results um, for the simulation. So I'm gonna create an output request. And this is kind of like similar to creating a goal in flow simulation for those of you who might've used flow simulation, but it's just gonna help us with post-processing. Uh, I'm concerned about the reaction forces from this, this twisting motion, this coupling that I've made. So we can create this output request to specifically monitor those reaction forces for us. And then by selecting history, it gives us that data as a function of our nonlinear pseudo time. So that'll help us when we get into uh, post-processing the results. But now that that's set, we can basically get ready to run this. I still run simulation checks before any simulation. Um, this is a built-in way that, um, that that structural performance engineer kind of looks at your entire simulation. So it looks at your FEM model, it looks at your loads and your fixtures, uh, it saves your simulation, which is always welcome. And it just kind of does a quick go, no go analysis to make sure that everything is, uh, is, is good to go before you commit to a large simulation solve. So we'll know that it's done when the results turns green. So we get that little green uh, dot on the results folder there indicating that um, our simulation checks were good. So now we can actually go in and begin our uh, actual simulation. The simulation checks aren't required, but I highly recommend them. There's a few ways we can uh, run our simulation. Local non-interactive is essentially you click run and you can close everything down and it'll just run in the background. Um, so it's not in your way. I like local interactive because it gives you kind of a solve dialog box with the iteration count and everything. Uh, it comes with four cores of embedded computation, but you can purchase tokens and credits to either increase the horsepower that you're using on your local machine or to solve on the cloud. Uh, the 3D experience content is just a lightweight simulation results file that we can view on the browser version. Right? Obviously, we can overwrite any previous results. That's just a default there. Uh, it's always good, good practice to check your units before you run a simulation. So for this meter kilogram second, it's just fine. Obviously there's unit definitions in there for any combination of units that you guys would use. All right, 
So when we click OK, it's going to launch the simulation, um, and we'll see the, uh, the interactive solver window pop up. So um, this analysis uh, does take a little while to run, obviously. Um, but we can view the iterations. There's a messages window where we can view any warnings or errors that are coming up. Um, you can view kind of previews of plots as it's, as it's solving. You can do a number of things, but through the magic of the internet, we're just gonna switch to uh, the completed version here. So we'll close out the solver window and take a look at our results. So uh, you can click the play icon in the 3D compass to animate basically anything in 3D experience. But this is how far we were able to simulate. So it simulated a lot farther than SolidWorks was able to get um, with barely changing anything, um, which, is, which is really neat. But we can switch this to maybe a displacement plot, which might give us a little bit more information here. And it's just a better looking plot in general. But notice that none of the circles are collapsing yet, which was kind of our goal. Um, we can step through each individual plot step from here I like this way of doing it better than how they do it in SOLIDWORKS. This is a little bit more user-friendly. Switching individual time steps in SOLIDWORKS is um, just a little bit more cumbersome. It's not bad by any means, but I want this to collapse some of those circles. So kind of in the downtime, I've applied a translation to that same coupling, but it's been suppressed. So what I wanna do is I'm just gonna switch back to our scenario app. And then we go back into our, our feature manager here that we talked about earlier. And I can just simply unsuppress just like you would in SOLIDWORKS, unsuppress that translation and then re-simulate it. So what this is gonna do is it's gonna do that twisting motion that we saw, but I'm also gonna force that coupling in a translational direction as well. And this will cause a number of those, those circular holes, excuse me, to come into a self-contact. This way we can just show off the general contact algorithm a little bit better. Um, so we'll let that run. And again, through the magic of the internet, um, we'll switch to the completed results here. Again, we can just animate it from the, uh, the 3D compass. And here you can see our uh, completed simulation. So we're twisting while we're pushing this. Notice the high strains in the top part of this and the complex contacts that are developing under here. Um, Robert and I are both in agreement. This is something I would never attempt in simulation premium. That amount of contact, um, you would just never get good convergence out of it. Um, you could probably get close uh, after a lot of trial and error, but this was a lot faster, right? So we could switch to the end just so we can view this contact pressure a little bit better and get an idea. So you can see that some of these areas are in contact, some of them aren't quite. They all have different um, areas of that kind of collapsed geometry that are in contact. So really, really complex, um, really cool stuff that we can do with this software. Uh, so we're gonna go and do an XY plot here so we can um, get an idea of how that coupling assists us with post-processing the results. So this is just a simple XY graph. Um, I try to be in the habit of naming things as I go along so I don't have a bunch of arbitrary named things in my tree. But let's say we want to plot, I don't know, the reaction forces of this, of this coupling as a function of time. So we can click OK here. It's relatively linear, but as we expand this out, you can see that it's not quite, we have some kind of waviness to that line um, that we can observe um, throughout the simulation. Um, but we can add more to this plot if we need to. So um, let's say I also want to superimpose the reaction moments since we're twisting this as well. Um, as a function of time. So there you can see our forces and our moments from that coupling um, that are there. Now you can obviously make this plot without the coupling, um, but it's just a little bit easier if you do it beforehand. Um, let's say I wanna add more to this. Let's say I wanna add the, the vector components of our reaction forces as opposed to the regular components. So you can see the X, Y, and Z um, vector components as well. So doing a little bit of work before the simulation runs, you know, creating these output requests is gonna help you extract this data just that little bit faster um, from the analysis. So close that out. So the last thing I'm gonna do is save this. Uh, by saving it, it's going to upload all these result files and everything that we've done so far to the cloud where all of it, where everything is stored. Um, so that way we can um, 
collaborate on this in particular. So we're going to take a look at that next. We're going to jump back onto um, sort of what I call the web apps, if you will. So here's my part. You can see that the mesh that we created now shows as um, now shows up in the 3D Play app, which is good. Um, this way that anybody I'm sharing this with can preview my mesh and make sure that um, it looks good enough um, for a simulation like this. Um, but what I really want to show off here is the simulation itself. So scrolling down, I can go to the physics simulation review widget. And again, these widgets, you can just drag them onto these dashboards, uh, very similar to how you resize and drag things around on your cell phone, right? And I'm going to drop the simulation results folder into that widget. Um, I'm going to resize this a little bit, give it a second to load. It has to load um, that simulation results file. So um, move this around a little bit while it's while it's loading. There it goes. Nice. Okay. So let me, since I want that to take precedence, I'm going to swap places of these two. Again, just clicking and dragging and resizing things. Um, however you like, this is totally um, all personal preference in here. But I want the, the simulation here to take precedent. So we can animate this just like we were doing on the native apps version. And you can see the results of our simulation. And this is all through a web browser. I'm in a, a Chrome tab right now. We could switch the time steps here uh, for individual time steps if we want. Um, you have a lot of like kind of basic post-processing tools available to you in this. Um, you can section these. Um, so we could do like a, a section view. Um, this works very similar to how you would expect. Oh, I've moved it off the part now and I can't find it. So uh, you get this little triad here and you can just kind of move things left and right and back and forth. There we go. So I can kind of drag this halfway through the part in that direction. You see it's kind of cut in half. So you can do annotations and measurements and all sorts of stuff through this, um, this simulation review widget. So I'm going to fit all of this to the screen so that it's kind of all locked in place and you can't accidentally drag it around. And then I'm going to actually just go to share this. So Robert, um, just so you know what I've been up to, I'm going to share this with you um, just so you can see what I've been up to all day. Um, so we just type them into the list, click it, you can write a note. And the beauty of this is when I click share on Robert's uh, 3D experience platform on the web, he's going to get a notification. And then he'll be able to just click that notification and open up this exact dashboard that I've made. He's going to see the results of my simulation. He's going to see that mesh in the bottom left. He's going to see all of the, the parts in the list. He'll be able to open anything he needs to from there. Um, this is a really awesome, unique way of collaborating that um, just a basic Windows Explorer doesn't really facilitate. So um, I've kind of been learning myself, teaching myself all of this, and I've been really enjoying um, the way that you can kind of share information on here. So as far as the, um, the, the demo content goes, we've pretty much finished up, right? We started in Sim Premium, saw the limitations there. We could probably get a little bit further, um, but we decided to use the 3D Experience Connector to manage our data, upload it to the platform where we can use the power of the Abacus solvers to um, solve this a little bit further and a little bit faster. So I like to finish this up. I get asked a lot about the computational needs. Since this is a cloud-based product, um, I want to kind of compare and contrast it with existing SolidWorks. So in SOLIDWORKS, there's no kind of core cap as far as your simulations go. Um, there is kind of a law of diminishing return past the number of cores, but uh, it doesn't cap you. Whereas the, on the platform, if they come with a four core embedded compute on your local machine. You can buy more horsepower to unlock more cores if you need it. Uh, I haven't needed to in my experience yet, um, but that you have that ability. Um, you can also buy cloud credits where you can actually just use um, the resources on the cloud to to handle the calculations for you. So you don't even have to, um, you know, make your computer fans turn on. Uh, whereas SolidWorks, there's really no cloud compute options, right? So a little bit of give and take as far as that's concerned. And just as kind of a, uh, a wrap up here, I like to cover the general benefits of the Abacus solver. So yes, it's limited to out of the box, limited to four cores of embedded compute, but in my experience, the Abacus solvers handle large problems and even complex problems a lot more efficiently. Um, for example, I had a, a demo that I did that, that SolidWorks simulation was taking like uh, a day to, to fail. And then when we uploaded that to the platform and tested it out, 
it took about six minutes to solve, right? So it's more powerful and it handles large amounts of data better. Uh, the general contact algorithm is probably the star feature here. Uh, in SOLIDWORKS, we would have had to set up that part, select all those faces and try to get the self-contact set up with a lot of uh, mesh controls and it would just be a nightmare to try to solve a problem like we just did here. Um, and speaking of the mesh, SOLIDWORKS, we can only use the tetrahedra, whereas we can use the, the hex meshes um, that are a little bit more robust for hyperelastic materials um, on the platform.